Welcome to the Jewelry Connoisseur Podcast. And now your host, Sonia Esther Soltani. Welcome to this new episode of the Jewelry Connoisseur Podcast. I'm your host today, Sonia Esther Soltani. I'm the editor in chief at Rappaport. And today our subject is the fascinating um, art nouveau jewelry. And my guest is Elise Zon Carlin. Hi, Elise. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Uh, we're hanging in here. <laughs> we don't go anyplace, but we're good. <laughs> Elise is um, an author, a jewelry historian, and a freelance curator. She's the co director of the Association for the Study of Jewelry and Related Arts. Um, she's also a very prolific author. One of her books is The Arts and Crafts Movement, Jewelry and Metal Work in the Arts and Craft Tradition. And she's also co-authored um, a book called Imperishable Beauty Art Nouveau Jewelry with um, Yvonne Markovic. And she's also the founder um, and executive editor of Ardonment Magazine. So today, I think, you know, Elise is definitely one of the, the most knowledgeable people we could have on this podcast to discuss Art Nouveau. To start and to give a bit of an overview on the, on this uh, very prolific, very exciting movement that's still getting a lot of traction among connoisseurs and jewelry collectors, what are the key features of Art Nouveau jewels? Well, that's easier said than uh, done to explain. There are a number of features, but not every piece of jewelry will certainly have this feature. Um, first of all, they were beautifully crafted pieces because the Art Nouveau jewelers um, actually were trained as jewelers before they started to make jewelry, unlike other art jewelry movements of the same time. They tend to not use a lot of precious stones. There is a heavy use of plique azur enamel, which is an enamel that has no backing. It's removed after it's created. So it's like a little stained glass window. The light passes through it. Um, you'll also see the use of horn quite a bit, which is heated so that it can be bent into shapes. Um, so that's another way that they didn't care about precious materials. They cared about the colors and the shapes and how things looked. We also find a lot of ivory in Art Nouveau jewelry because King Leopold of the Belgian Congo, he ruled the Belgian Congo, he was giving ivory to jewelers trying to get it to be used more. As far as the motifs, we see all kinds of things. There's lots of nature depicted in Art Nouveau jewelry, and Lalique in particular, the most famous of the Art Nouveau jewelers, he depicted nature not just beautiful when things were blooming, but also in the seasons when things were dying. He was famous for that. Um, you see a lot of butterflies and dragonflies and exotic flowers that have a very sensual overtone. You see women depicted in jewelry really for the first time, except for in ancient cameos. And the women were sometimes by themselves, full figure, usually dressed in kind of diaphanous Greek style clothing. Sometimes it was just their head with their long flowing hair. And at other times, a woman and an insect or a woman and a mermaid might be combined into one mythological creature. And we also see uh, mythological, uh, mythological, thought, sorry, I'm having trouble saying that, mythological creatures like Medusa from the myth where Medusa, whoever looked at her, they turned to stone, is also depicted in Art Nouveau jewelry. But mostly it has long flowing lines. That's one of its uh, hallmarks. And can we situate it in, um, in time? It's actually quite a short period, right? Yes. I, I like to use the time 1895 to about 1915. Mm. By 1915 or so, it was already burning itself out. As opposed to the arts and crafts period, which took place in other countries at the same time, another art movement. It continued on well into the uh, 20th century in a lot of cases. So you mentioned the, the French with La Ligue, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the other artists, uh, jewelry artists of the time. But um, Art Nouveau was different um, in America. Yes. What, what were the big differences between, between the schools of uh, Art Nouveau jewelry? I like to talk about art jewelry at this time period in general. And it just manifests itself different in different countries. There was Art Nouveau was basically in France and Belgium. And there were a few American makers 
uh, who created it, but it was more mass marketed and it was much more restrained than the French Art Nouveau. In England, uh, Scotland, Ireland, uh, New Zealand, and in the United States, the arts and crafts movement was very popular. Um, it was also not requiring expensive materials, hardly used stones, diamonds never appeared, but it had a different look to it. It was more restrained, maybe a little more abstract. And then in Germany and Austria, they called it Jugendstil or Young Style. In Scandinavia, it was called Skonwerk. Each country had its own influences. They all were desirous of creating something new and also revolting against um, industrial revolution, the mass production of jewelry that all looked the same. But there were other influences, particularly nationalist, nationalistic influences in each country. And France in particular had a number of things that influenced their jewelry. For one thing, they had lost that race to be one of the biggest industrial nations. England, France, I mean, England, Germany, and the United States surpassed them. So they decided if they couldn't uh, be the best in industry, then they would be the best in luxury. So Art Nouveau jewelry was for the rich. It was very expensive. It was so outrageous that only somebody who had a lot of nerve and a lot of money would wear it out in public. So that makes it different than the art jewelry in the other countries. In addition, France had lost the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. They were really hurting. They expected to win that war. So they wanted to look back to the past where France was in its glory, and that was the 18th century. And the style that was popular then was Rococo, which had curvy lines. And so we see those curvy lines turning up in Art Nouveau much more than in art jewelry in other countries. There was another important issue, and that's that women were wanting to work outside the home and go to college. And the French, who always idolized their women, started to have kind of a schizophrenic feeling about women, that they still idolized them, but they were frightened by them also because they were going to go outside the home, not be home taking care of things. And they weren't having as many babies if they were out of the house, which meant that if there was another war with Germany, France could lose again. So you see in the jewelry, this in many of the pieces, either the idolization of women looking like Greek goddesses or the fear when they're depicted as Medusa or some other scary creature. That's fascinating. That's, that's such a fascinating thing. How much is you, you can see from... a uh... A cultural context, just looking at a piece of jewelry, I found that absolutely... Uh, yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I think also, among other influences, the, uh, of Art Nouveau, you had uh, the opening of Japan uh, around that time, after having been closed for, for a few centuries. Yes, absolutely. Um, there, there was Japanese um, prints and other objects became very popular as they came to Europe. And a lot of the nature that you see in the jewelry is definitely, you can see it in Japanese woodcuts. So that was definitely an influence. In your book, Imperishable Beauty, that, that you wrote with uh, Yvonne Markovitz, you mentioned um, something about symbolism and uh, the movement of symbolist painters having an influence on Art Nouveau jewelry, but Art Nouveau jewelry is not as esoteric as symbolist painting or art. Can, can you tell us a bit more about this? The symbolist movement um, was a movement in France in art, literature, and music. And it was very obscure to the average person. The artist used symbols that only his or her, but it was mostly men, um, only their direct circle would understand what they meant. And so we do see some symbolic, symbolic things in the jewelry, but I don't think it was quite as uh, meant to mean certain things as the paintings and the music did. But it certainly probably uh, was an influence that it was there that um, certain uh, flowers, for example, that were depicted had a sexual nature, and that had to do with how men were looking at women. I mean, there were also um, other things going on in France then. 
Um, this is the turn of the century. And because this new century was coming, people were fearful of change. We were scared here. Our computers were going to stop working <laughs> when it changed from 2000 to 2000 uh, to the 21st century. So there were all kinds of things going on. There was mysticism. People were having seances. Um, there's a religious group called the Rosicrucians who were popular in the 16th century and then came back in the 19th century, and they were very mystical. People were drinking absinthe and taking mind-altering drugs. And certainly the jewelry often has an otherworldly look to it, which came from all of those influences as well. That's, that's really interesting. And what about, I mean, it seems like when we say Art Nouveau jewelry, the first name that we think of is René Lally. Yes, of course. <laughs> so uh, so um, can, can you tell us a bit more about, about Lally and the other uh, creators from, from that time that are still, you know, that people, collectors are still interested to purchase and know more about? Lally was obviously uh, the master of Art Nouveau. Um, and he trained with high-end jewelers. He was an excellent goldsmith before he left on his own to start making Art Nouveau jewelry. But his work is interesting because it's so over the top. Many of the pieces are very large and depicting women's bodies, which was not done before this time. And um, so he had an interesting clientele. He had very wealthy women who might buy the jewelry but not actually wear it. They would just sit it on their uh, dresser and look at it. And then he had the women of the demi monde, which were women that were kept by wealthy men. But in France, you were actually kind of a part of a society when you were part of the demi monde, if you were a courtesan. Um, what you wore and where you went was written up in the newspapers. So they wore fabulous jewelry, and they weren't afraid to wear Lalique's jewelry in out in the open. So he's probably the most famous jeweler and his imagination was just unbelievable. But there are also many other important jewelers from that period. Henri Van Veer, uh, Alphonse Mucha, who also made jewelry for Sarah Bernhardt like Lalique did, Lucien Gautre, George Fouquet, and many others. In Belgium, there was Philippe Wolfers, and then we have very well-known people in other countries as well, but the, there are many, many makers in France. I know you're a jewelry historian, and you, you obviously deal more with uh, the, the history, the legacy, but do you see pieces that are still highly collectible? Um, oh. There was a sale, I think, two years ago, if I'm in Christie's, maybe it was already three years ago, Yes, um, in Geneva, a absolutely beautiful collection of Art Nouveau jewelry that matched all estimates and everything. And do you see certain types of jewelry from this time, the Lalique pieces, because they signed um, having popular with collectors today? Well, yes, I think it, it's very interesting. Art Nouveau fell out of favor fairly quickly, and it kind of remained dormant for years and years. And I would say maybe in around the 60s, people started to look at it again. And maybe it's a coincidence, but the 60s was a wild and crazy time. And if you look at posters of people like Jimi Hendrix, you see the same kind of Art Nouveau crazy line. So once it got rediscovered, um, its popularity just grew, I guess, because it's so beautiful. But that auction, the pieces would have done well no matter what, but that auction came from a collection that had been stored away and nobody had seen for many, many years. So whenever you have fresh pieces from a, an important maker or important genre come on the market, that, that's why the prices go crazy like that. But Lalique pieces and other Art Nouveau jewelers are still commanding very high prices. So I still see them as being very uh, coveted by collectors today. And are they easy to wear, like because they're made with very intricate, no. delicate <laughs> enamel. No, very <laughs> difficult to wear. Um, first of all, it's amazing that as many pieces have survived as they have because they are so delicate. That enamel can break very easily. The only pieces that I really think are wearable are necklaces or pendants. Brooches, maybe, but I see rings come up at auction. I would never wear an Art Nouveau ring. I would be so worried I would bang my hand against something. You don't see really earrings, not too many bracelets. There are bracelets, 
But again, that's a problem. You could bang the bracelet against something and destroy the enamel. And there's very few people that can repair that kind of enamel. So I, I would say necklaces or pendants are the most wearable, but they're still delicate. And that's why I think the majority of important pieces are in museums, not so much in private collections. It sounds like you have to, to look at a piece of Art Nouveau jewelry the same way as the, the courtesan did, just to put it in display and look at it, not to wear it, or the, Absolutely. <laughs> the initial collectors. If I were lucky enough to be able to buy it, that's what I would be doing. <laughs> and talking about that, which which uh, drool to, from this period would you is your is your favorite or you're the most impressed with? Well, I I take anything by Lalique, anything. <laughs> I mean, some people some pieces are more interesting than others, but there's nothing he did that wasn't at least very nice. I would take any piece by any artist. It's beyond my pocketbook <laughs> to be able to buy Art Nouveau. Um, but there have been some very important collectors. Um, Dr. Sadiloff, Joseph Sadiloff, he was collecting Art Nouveau when uh, nobody was interested in it. And he used to tell this great story that he'd go around to the shops and ask if they had any Art Nouveau jewelry. And they'd say, oh, we can't give it to you because we're saving it for that crazy doctor. And he was the crazy doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but he amassed a wonderful collection. And in fact, Imperishable Beauty, the, my, the book that I co-authored with Yvonne, that was actually the catalog for the exhibition of his jewelry at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And he's, before he passed away, he donated pieces to several museums. And I think his daughter, who now owns the collection, continues to do the same thing because these pieces really should be shared with the world. They're so beautiful. I would also recommend anyone who's interested to, to read more about Art Nouveau to, to really have a, a look at the book that you and Ivan Markovitz wrote, um, Imperishable Beauty, as you said, is from the, the Museum of Fine Art Fine Arts in Boston. This uh, phenomenal collection, really superb with a... Uh, really interesting, insightful introductions by, by the both of you. And where else would you, would you recommend jury lovers to, to go to, to museums in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. to, to get a better idea of what Art Nouveau jewelry looks like? Um, in this country, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston has a wonderful collection. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has some beautiful pieces. Uh, in France, the Musée des Beaux-Arts Décoratifs and the Gulbenkian uh, Museum in Lisbon has probably the biggest collection of Lalique. He bought directly from Lalique and Calhus Gulbenkian, and he was a great patron. He's another reason why Lalique probably did as well as he did, because this man was just buying the pieces as he made them. But there's some other books I would recommend as well. Um, Vivian Becker's book on Art Nouveau was written quite a long time ago, but it's an excellent book and it covers, I think, just about every maker you would want to know about. Because it's older, there's black and white photography as well as color, but it's still a wonderful resource and I would highly recommend that. And there are a number of other books on Lalique that um, are very useful as well. There are many books on Lalique. That seems like uh, we have some work to do. <laughs> it really, yes, it's a never-ending subject. <laughs> it's it's really really interesting to to know more about this area because I think we you know you always oppose Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and it's it's so nice to see that you know the, the, there is such a, a ma major difference between the two. And it seems like 1915 is this break in the. Uh, in, civil, in Western society and civilization as well. So that is, that is really, really interesting. Um, the other thing I just thought of, um, there's also a set of books called the Paris Salons, uh, where artists and jewelers would exhibit their work. And these are kind of catalogs, and they're, they're by subject matter. So there is one on jewelry and metalwork. And again, it's in black and white, but you can find designs of many, many jewelers in there that salon books were put together based on contemporary catalogs of the time. So it's very useful for re research. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elise. I think that's, uh, that's really given us a, a beautiful overview of uh, Art Nouveau and, and certainly created more desire to, to learn more about this, uh, this movement that is uh, 
so, so important in our injury history. Yeah, so it will also take your breath away to look at the pieces. Yes, yes. Not to wear them, maybe, but definitely to examine every single detail of this extremely intricate and, uh, and exquisite uh, jewels. Thank you so much, Elise. We will, oh, my pleasure. We will um, give more information in, on the blog on Jewelry Connoisseur. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have more of, uh, of the pleasure of listening to you in real life at conferences. I know you, you speak to a lot of conferences in uh, normal times. This year has been a bit more challenging, but Elise is always uh, giving very interesting lectures on, uh, on jewelry history in different places. What, when is the next event for you, Elise, that it's available uh, to publicize? We, our conference is going to be in October virtually. So... I can send you the information about it, but we hope that more people will be able to join us because it doesn't require traveling. It's certainly new territory for us, but we'll also be sponsoring a lecture in October on jewelry of the Nizam. So I won't be giving it. We have a wonderful uh, jewelry historian from India that's going to give the lecture. And then after that, our conference will come. Great. So stay tuned, October. A digital conference, and we'll definitely write a bit more about it in the Andrew Connoisseur. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. Have a great day. Thank you very much for having me. And this is the end of this new episode in Jewelry Connoisseur. Until the next one, bye. Thanks for joining us at the Jewelry Connoisseur podcast. If you enjoyed this and would like more top quality jewelry content, check out the Jewelry Connoisseur blog at jewelryconnoisseur.net. 